The following is a conversation with the political scientist Bu Rothstein. The introduction in English starts around minute 2. Olá, o meu nome é José Maria Pimentel e este é o 45 graus. Quem ouve o 45 graus há algum tempo sabe que eu acho que Portugal tem um problema estrutural de falta de qualidade das instituições. Somos, historicamente, um país mal governado. E isso, não estando de todo circunscrito ao Estado, começa aí. Temos uma dificuldade estrutural em pensar e planear a longo prazo. Temos uma grande renitência em decidir e fazer escolhas difíceis. E, ao mesmo tempo, apesar disso, temos políticas públicas frequentemente erráticas e que estão sempre a mudar. E, claro, nem vale a pena referir os exemplos, muitos deles recentes, de corrupção, nepotismo, clientelismo e outros tipos de discriminação. Tudo isto reflete-se negativamente numa série de indicadores de desenvolvimento, desde o crescimento económico à desigualdade de oportunidades e qualidade de vida, nos quais continuamos a estar, na maioria dos casos, bem atrás dos países com que nos gostaríamos de comparar. E, no entanto, a verdade é que somos um país democrático, com falhas, mas claramente um dos países do mundo que se podem considerar democracias avançadas. A democracia é, obviamente, um bem em si mesmo, ou seja, independentemente dos resultados materiais que produz ou não produz. Mas a verdade é que esperaríamos também que a democracia ajudasse a garantir que o país é bem governado. No entanto, isso não tem acontecido e não estamos sozinhos. Portugal não é o único país do mundo em que a democracia não chega para ter um bom governo e não somos sequer dos casos mais extremos em que este fenómeno acontece. Foi para compreender melhor este puzzle que decidi trazer ao podcast o convidado deste episódio, o cientista político sueco Bu Rothstein, um dos principais investigadores mundiais na área da qualidade da governação. Como a conversa decorreu em inglês, e para que esta introdução possa ser compreendida por quem não fala a língua de Camões, vou passar agora para inglês. My guest in this episode is Bu Rothstein, one of the world's leading researchers in the field of quality of government. He was, for most of his career, professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, with also a brief stint at the University of Oxford. In 2004, he founded, together with his colleague Soren Holmberg, the Quality of Government Institute at the same university, which has since become the world's main research center in this field. This was a fascinating conversation. We started by discussing the puzzle of why democracy is not enough to ensure good governance. And this happens, according to Rothstein and other authors, because these two dimensions of the political system are very different in nature. Democracy refers to the input side of politics, that is, the way to which access to political power works through elections, whereas quality of government refers to the output side of politics, that is, to the way political power is exercised. So while democracy may enable voters to select politicians and policies that reflect their concerns, that is not by itself sufficient to guarantee that those policies will be enacted effectively and without improper behavior on the part of the political actors. This led us to the key question of how exactly do we define quality of government? One of the most influential definitions in this field was proposed by Rothstein himself, together with Jan Turell, and it defines quality of government as having to do with the extent to which the government operates with impartiality. This concept is closely related to corruption, that is, to the absence of it, but it is actually broader than that. In practice, for a state to act impartially means that it is not influenced by anything from bribes, political affiliation, personal connections, or any kind of prejudice based on race, ethnicity, or gender. Rothstein's idea is clearly persuasive, and he will explain it better than I do, but other authors have proposed alternative definitions, and we also discussed some of them. One of those ideas is that of state capacity. Some authors point out that it is not enough for the public officials to act in a proper way. In order to be able to implement public policies, the state also needs resources, such as infrastructures, adequate information, and a body of qualified and motivated civil servants. Other authors, such as Francis Fukuyama, another well-known political scientist, emphasize the importance of bureaucratic autonomy, that is, the extent to which civil servants are protected from pressures exerted by elected politicians. And there are many other related definitions, such as the idea of inclusive institutions, proposed by the economists Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson, which we also discussed, or the definition prescribed by the World Bank, which goes farther than these, perhaps too far, encompassing, for instance, the capacity of the state to implement sound policies. It was, as I said, a fascinating conversation in which we covered a lot of ground on the topic of quality of government. 
we discussed the practical effects of bad governance for citizens, the link between low quality of government and populism, the puzzle of the rise of China in the last decades, despite its authoritarian nature and its less than impartial government, and we also discussed whether condemnation of corruption is a human universal or it depends on culture, the effect of quality of government on social capital, and the relationship, if any, between the quality of governance in the public sector and in the private sector. Right towards the end, I asked my guest for a policy prescription. How can we improve democracy's ability to enhance quality of government? What can we do in order to improve the ability of democracy to lead to better governance? And he has, as you will see, a very clear-cut recipe for this. Hope you enjoy our conversation e até ao próximo episódio. Professor Bu Rothstein, welcome to Conitating Grove. Thank you. We'll be talking about quality of government. And I guess most people, uh, if not everyone, agrees that quality of government or quality of governance, whatever you want to call it, it's important, if not crucial. What is maybe less obvious is how it relates to democracy, because I, I would say that for most people, the main determinant of quality of government is democracy. So they will tend to think that the more democratic a government is or a state is, the best govern it is. But that's not quite right, is it? <laughs> your research and your colleagues doesn't indicate a, a sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between democracy and, and quality of government. Well, it is true that what you call the elite democracies usually also have high quality of government. But the curve is actually U-shaped, meaning that countries that are a little in between democracy and autocracy seems to be, in many cases, the worst corrupt ones. And then you have a number of cases where uh, you do not have democracy, but you have quite high quality of government. Singapore is yeah. the, one of the cases, but there are other cases. Actually, if you um, look at the data, there are about 10 countries of the 140 that are, are in the database that are democracies but have very low quality of government and are highly corrupt. And then there are about the same, at about 10 countries that are not democracies but that do have quality of government. And then there is um, electoral democracy and quality of government seems to have some tension. So, for example, in new democracies, there seems to be a number of temptations for the new government that is elected that they have a huge difficulties to handle. That if they cannot handle it, it will destroy quality of government. One is, of course, to use jobs in the public sector to reward their political followers. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. will destroy uh, uh, meritocracy. Another thing is that nepotism seems to be a very big problem in many new democracies. A third problem is since they usually do not have organized funding for political campaigns and for political parties so that they can run elections, the temptation to plunder the public coffers to finance your party becomes very big. And then the fourth thing, because they usually do not have impartial, reasonably quality government, it's very difficult for them to implement uh, universal or broad-based reforms. Instead, there is a huge temptation to go for clientelistic policies. So you will reward those villages or parts of cities that uh, you know a majority have voted for you and you will punish the others. So there, there are sort of um, logical differences between what we think is quality of government and especially weak democracies. Mm -hmm. You can see this also now in established democracies that uh, electoral democracy is run on partisanship. No one goes into politics to be impartial. You want yes, something for the poor or for the environment or for women or for your ethnic group. But the logic, as we have defined it for quality of government, is impartiality in the exercise of public power. And you see this also now in, in some established democracy. Take uh, the United States under Donald Trump, where he tried to politicize something that is very dangerous, namely if you politicize 
the election administration. He also tried to politicize much of the public administration, not to speak of the courts. You see the same in Hungary. You see the same in, in Poland. So here is a tension between partisanship, which is perfectly legitimate on the input side of the political system. What we think is the legitimate norm in the implementation of public policies, namely impartiality. And it's interesting because a lot of, you could call them classical authors, distrusted a lot party politics. Even besides authors, I'm reminded of even George Washington was famous to distrust the idea of having parties in the system precisely for this idea. But then the fact is that democracies developed and we ended up building solid democracies even with parties. So even with that partial agenda of, of, of political parties. But there is a historical logic here, except for the United States, which do have a lot of problems with politicization, for example, of the courts yeah. that are completely politicized. All what you can say the elite democracies in Northwestern Europe actually created reasonable quality of government procedures before they became yeah. democracies, not <laughs> the other way around. That. Yeah, and, and the logic is, is quite simple. If you cannot create the neutral, impartial, professional election administration, the losing side will not accept the election result. And so you will get all kinds of conflicts, even civil wars and all kinds of problems. Think about uh, sports. You have two football teams. If the one football team think that the other football team has bought a referee, they will not come and play, right? <laughs> so uh, all such systems depends on that you have at least some minimal trust in the impartiality of those who are going to implement the rules. Hmm. The way you describe it, and that idea is also present to some extent in the literature, it almost seems that there's a, countries m might find themselves in a trap here. Because if they don't have an enough developed government in terms of quality of government before democratizing and, and also in terms of an impartial management of elections, it might create like a vicious circle out of which you cannot get, right? Yeah, it's very difficult if you're two political parties and you know that the other party will politicize and use the public sector to reward their followers. You will do the same. But for me personally, a very tragic example is South Africa that have tremendous problems just with basic infrastructure, you know, electricity, water, roads. And one of the reasons is, of course, that the ANC decided to politicize very much the public administration. And if you do that, one thing is very clear, you will lose competence. You will lose competence for two reasons. First, people who do not belong to your party will not even try to go into the public administration or become a professional engineer for roads or electricity because they know that they will not get a fair chance. And then the people you recruit will not have the right competence because they are party loyalists. They are not professionals. So there are, there are a number of tragic examples here where you can make a kind of... Um, ideal model here, so uh, that of the different operational logics. So electoral democracy depends on partisanship, but quality of government on impartiality. And electoral democracy is based on, on rhetoric, if not demagogy, while quality of government is based on, on a kind of matter of factness. Electoral democracy is very person-centered, but the ideal of the quality of government is impersonality. And uh, it's based on political loyalty, the electoral democracy, but quality of government is based on meritocracy. And in quality of government, the rule of law is very important. But in electoral democracy, you can say the rule of numbers is very important. <laughs> so there are actually two quite distinct mm -hmm. operational mm -hmm. logics here. And I'm not saying that the one should dominate. I'm not arguing for rule by experts. You can say that I'm, I'm arguing for rule through experts. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yes. but uh, it, that's, it's, it's that's very clear that, yeah. that there are, these are two different, yeah. you can say, ideals. Both yes, are yeah. important. In a good democracy, you have both, and they can sort of coexist. But you have to be aware that there is a tension here between them. We see this now in Sweden. We have a new populist party who is sort of part of the government, 
And one thing they want to do is to politicize the cultural sector. So they want to decide what uh, plays should be played on the theater and what the museums should exhibit or not. And we are not used to this. We're used to that there are professionals who, do, who make these decisions, not the politicians. Yeah, yeah. And as you point out, the two concepts are actually quite different. And if they work well, they sort of control each other each in other. a sense. Yeah, yeah. that's the point. So, that, that's a very important point made in a book by my two colleagues, Carl Dahlström and Victor Lapuente, that they, in ideal system, these two logics or sectors of the political system control each other. Yeah. 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 That is what produces the best results. So politicians are often a little too opportunistic and too clientelistic. But if their policies have to run through meritocratic, recruited, high-level bureaucrats, their logic is uh, that they do not want to look bad in the eyes of their professional peers. So they want to be professional, they want to be impartial. And so you get this uh, quite nice tension that in many cases, produces quite good results. Mm -hmm. And it, it also works, I guess, in the other way around, right? So the quality of government defined in, in this sense would also not be enough because without democratic accountability, you might end up even acting in an impartial way, not producing results which are aligned with the, with the will of the people, if you will. Of course, of yeah. course. I'm not yeah. arguing against democracy. No, no, of You're course. saying democracy <laughs> is not electoral <laughs> democracy. Well, it's very clear. Electoral democracy without a reasonably uncorrupt, impartial, professional civil service and without the rule of law will not produce good outcomes when it comes to human well-being, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. And by the way, one doubt I get when reading this literature is where you put the boundary on who is covered by this impartiality dimension. Is it just the public servants, so the, the public bureaucracy, or the elected politicians as well, the political representatives? No, the political representatives, their job is to be partisan. But like they the are, government. Yeah, they are the yeah. government. Let me take an example from my own country. So we have had a lot of support for farmers in northern Sweden. Hmm. And it's, from my perspective, a complete waste of money. <laughs> it's so far north. No, no one should do farming up there. But they want to do it for uh, yeah, uh, historical reasons. Yeah, we and have support. the same thing. Yeah. But the important thing is when this partisan politics is going to be implemented, I'm absolutely sure that yeah. the civil servants in the National Bureau for Agricultural Affairs will not only give money to the party loyalist or to their friends, or mm -hmm. th they will act in an impartial way. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is the tension mm -hmm. yeah. that needs to be handled. Yeah, so no, now it's perhaps a good time to delve into the, the concepts behind the definition of quality of government. Your own definition is that of impartiality, you've mentioned it quite a few times which is very closely connected, but not the same thing as corruption, right? Absence of corruption, of course. Yeah, <laughs> the problem we had was this, that nobody has been able to present the working definition of corruption. The most standard and mostly used definition is something like abuse or misuse of public power for private gain. Yeah, now, exactly. this is an empty definition because abuse is not defined. You do not know what norm that is transgressed when you can speak about corruption. And this, of course, makes it impossible to measure it and it invites all kinds of cultural relativism. What is corruption in Denmark is something completely different than corruption in Portugal, for example, which is not. That is not how people think. So we try to do what in military terms is known as uh, when you make a circle operation. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know the exact English word, but something like this. So we try to define what is the opposite of corruption? What norms do we want the people who work in the public sector to obey, to uphold? And uh, then we settled for impartiality. We could have settled for the rule of law, but there are many areas in the public sector in a modern state healthcare, education, yeah. care for elderly, where the concept of the rule of law really doesn't work. It's too narrow, right? Yeah, it's too narrow. And, you know, people who work that, they, 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 they don't think of themselves as legal bureaucrats in yes. a way. They are professionals. So that is yeah. why we settle for impartiality. Now, we have looked at um, 
ethical codes for, I think, some 30 countries. Many countries produce ethical codes for the civil service. And we have not only looked in Western countries, also countries in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Asia. And the most common norm in these ethical codes is impartiality. And of course, this comes basically from the work of the famous philosopher John Rawls. This is his idea about justice. I think it is important because what people think of as injustice is not if you are, get different treatment, because in many cases, in most cases, different treatment is acceptable. Some students need more <laughs> tutoring, some, some patients need more. What people think of as unjust is favoritism. And favoritism is the opposite of impartiality, that you get things from the public sector that you're not supposed to get because either you have paid money under the table or you know the right people or you belong to the right party or whatever. So uh, this is why we settle for with impartiality. You actually know what type of norm that should not be transgressed. And that is, I think, a big advantage to just speak about uh, abuse. Um, That's an empty signifier. Nobody knows what abuse is. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, And and from a normative perspective, focus on justice. I agree that impartiality captures a lot of what's relevant here. My doubt or my reservations if we with with impartiality is to what extent does it capture other dimensions of of a good government that go beyond justice and are related to or are correlated and lead to good developments. Of course, there's one very important difficulty in this debate, which is that if you go too far, you are already measuring the outcomes and not the quality of government, which I know that's a limitation. But one thing we tend to think about when thinking about government of quality is a government which is able to pursue rational decisions, put long-term goals in front of short-term ones, uh, which is one of the the problems in those young democracies you described in the beginning. Do you think this flows directly from impartiality or would we need a different... Of course, there's this literature on state capacity, which sort of uh, intersects here. I'm very curious to get your take on this. So how do you see impartiality related to this? We, and I say we because I work with so many colleagues in the Quality of Government Institute, We think of impartiality as a basic norm, like, for example, in Robert Dahl's theory of democracy, he think of political equality as the basic norm. And then this can translate into very different, and for historical reasons, special secondary norms. So if you take democracy, the Swiss democracy is very different from the American democracy that is very different from the Portuguese democracy, right? But they are all based on this basic norm, political equality. And I think the same for the civil service, the the state, the public sector. So the public administration, how it's actually built, can look very different. But it should always be possible to base this specific institutional configuration on this idea of impartiality. Now, you want competence, fine. But... In practice, impartiality translates into meritocracy in recruitment and when you promote people. And that is likely to increase competence. Second, you want long term. Well, you get long term with this type of civil servants because they are not dependent on the next election in two or three years. So their sort of logic of reference is is not the next election. Their logic of references is, as you propose it, is accountability to their peers. Basically. Yeah, I right. think very much so. Yeah. yeah. So it's a reputational thing, even not a monetary one, right? So even it's not even a monetary prize or a financial L- prize. Let it's, me yeah. tell you, very few people go into the civil service to become rich. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that no, we can agree say, on. Say you are head of a, a hospital. You're a doctor and you have been promoted because both your medical skills and your administrative skills to be head of a hospital. Then, of course, the most important thing for you is that the other heads of hospitals in your country or in your region think that you are doing a good job. That's the most important thing for you. That is how professionals and civil service think about what is good. 
Yeah, it's true. And so you, as long as you have meritocratic recruiting and safe careers and, and a predictable path, that's should in two, right? Yeah, I'm not talking for sort of a very rigid type where you enter into the civil service after an exam when you are 23 and then is promoted every third year. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of meritocracy where other professionals are really trying to evaluate your factual competence not paper competence. <laughs> that is the <laughs> yeah. important thing. Yeah. So basically, to sum up your argument, you think that bureaucratic capacity and quality would tend to flow or to be associated with an impartial system, with an impartial bureaucracy? Yes. I'm very curious to know how you think this idea, your idea of impartiality, relates to another strand in the literature, this one coming from, from economics, that from Massimo and, and Robinson, among other authors, which emphasizes what they call inclusive institutions, which is a... I actually, I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's a narrow concept or a broader concept. It's a different one. I have the highest respect of Darren Asimov, and Jim Robinson. They are outstanding researchers. But conceptual precision is not their best game in time. <laughs> inclusive, what does that mean? You know, it's a far too loose concept for me. And when they say that democracy promotes growth... If you look closely on how they measure democracy, many of their measures are quality of government, like the rule of mm -hmm. law and things mm -hmm. like that. And if you look even more closely, the heavy effect comes from the quality of government factors, not from electoral democracy. No, that's true. I think their idea of inclusive institutions is much more closely related to quality of government than, than democracy, yeah, because it yeah. has a rule of law, the respect for property rights, all of those things are, well, it's, impartial. It's also, the case, it's also the case that when people make up their mind, if they think that their government is legitimate, democratic rights are important, yes, like uh, free speech and right to vote and, and so. It's also that out comes in terms of pensions and healthcare is important. But both these are far less important than things like government effectiveness, rule of law, and control of corruption. That is what people pay most attention to when they make up their mind if they think that their government is legitimate. It's not the democratic rights. And how can you think about this? Well, because, you know, most political philosophers have put their name in blood that it's democratic rights that give legitimacy. It's not. My theory runs like this. In elections around the world, about a third of the electorate do not even bother to vote, right? Even fewer take part in demonstrations, write op-ed articles. Or... Now, what happens in a democracy if you do not or cannot use your democratic rights with your life? Nothing. It just goes on, right? However... If you cannot get health care to your kids because you cannot afford to pay the bribes at the public hospital, the police won't protect you because you belong to a minority. You will not get that job that you are most qualified for in City Hall because you, you do not belong to the right party or you're a woman or so. And the fire brigade won't come because you call from the wrong part of the city. Then you are in real trouble in your life, right? So people are much more dependent on that uh, the, the public sector when it is supposed to deliver, actually delivers, than they are from democracy. Now, again, I'm a big fan of democracy. I don't, <laughs> do not argue against democracy, but you have to sort of be realistic here. Yeah. What is important for people? And there's even another effect, which is that when the quality of government is low, so when, when people are not getting what they are voting for, their satisfaction with democracy would also decrease because they, they feel that they are, their needs are not being factored into the, the decisions. Even if they go as far as being reflected into policies, the fact that the state machinery is not efficient means that they might not be implemented. My close colleague and co-author, John Theorel, who is now professor at the Department of Political Science in Stockholm, he has not published this yet, but he has presented the data. He has tried statistically using the VDEM data, you know, the Varieties of Democracy Institute, our sister institute, to try to explain what can explain the democratic backlash we have seen the last since basically 2010 2012 is i was going it, uh, to ask exactly about that 
Is yes. it low economic growth? No. Is it increased inequality? No. There are only two factors that have any weight. One is size. So big countries, democracies have gone back more. The other is corruption. What explains the democratic backlash is basically, uh, since you cannot do much about your country's size, it is corruption, period. Sorry, before we go to corruption, why is the, what's the causality on the country's side side? You see more democratic backlash in big countries. Russia, United States. Uh, but but is there a reason? So, so does, does Tyrell have a, like propose a th an hypothesis for that or just that's just a correlation one we cannot explain? Or? I don't know. I don't know. You, okay. you have we'll to see. ask. I, I haven't <laughs> thought about we'll this. <laughs> yeah. Since I'm policy oriented, you cannot do so much about Yes, Your sure, sure. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. You can split up, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's usually not, not easy. But it's very interesting you raised this point because I was going precisely to ask you about this because when one starts thinking conceptually about the difference between democracy or quality of democracy, if you will, and quality of government, and then you think about this backlash against democracy and populism, one very quickly sees that the answer is much more on the quality of government side than on the democracy side, which is interesting because it goes counter to many arguments. For instance, Kaz Mood's argument, I guess, uh, you probably heard, So his argument is that this backlash, what he calls a, an illiberal democracy or an illiberal democratic movement, is a response against a, a liberalism which had become undemocratic. But in a sense, the problem might not be lack of democracy, but rather lower quality of government. So, so Because in many cases, what you see the backlash against is not always, but it's corruption and other forms of impartiality in a sense of not reflecting the needs of, of people who were, were kind of felt that they were left out of the system. Yeah, I have a paper where I tried to explain the success of Donald Trump from a corruption perspective. And uh, I think it makes quite some sense. First, in his rhetoric, was very much centered around that his opponents were corrupt and that Washington was corrupt. Mm -hmm. Draining the swamp and all that. Uh, yeah, and secondly, the liberal Democrats in the United States have been very much connected to different forms of quotas for minorities uh, or preferential treatment and so on. And this is a very difficult policy to implement in a way that people find acceptable. And there is a interesting political philosopher, Mark Lilla, who have made this yes. argument mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that one of the reasons that the Democrats have lost so badly is that many white working class voters feel probably they are completely wrong, but they feel that they are now discriminated against in an unjust way. I mean, this is probably factually completely untrue, but that doesn't mean so much because people, it's their mindset. People sure do not vote from facts, they of vote course, from of, their mindset. Yes, of perception. And, and, and it's very difficult to make these changes in a democracy when you have an uneven starting point. People will create some expectations, which are legitimate to some extent because they were born into that realm and then it's very difficult. Politically, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But we digressed a bit. Let's go back to the, <laughs> let's go back to the quality of government and, and define as a, acting impartially as, as you define it and with an autonomous bureaucracy, with, with capacity, with meritocratic hiring and, and, and all of that. Although it's, as you say, empirical research proves that there is indeed a, a very a high correlation between quality of government and, and development outcomes, there are also some puzzles. And one of them, I ask this because I know you have a paper on this, maybe the most obvious puzzle is that of China, right? Because China's, although they do have even historically a developed bureaucracy, it's not exactly this Weberian model that we are accustomed to in Europe, right? And you have an explanation for this. So you have a, an hypothesis for why, even without this model, they, they are being successful so far. Yeah, yeah. now you are right. I mean, uh, the economic performance of China is maybe the hardest nut to crack. Going back to Asimoglu and Robinson, they just throw up their hands and say, China will break. Yes. Now, my, my background, I basically think of myself as an organizational theorist masquerading as a political scientist. <laughs> so I think of myself very much in my previous life in organizational theory. What I found is that China has a very special type of 
public administration, which in the organizational literature has different names, the mission organization, the counter organization. And this combines high level of professionalism and competence with political loyalty. So it's a very different uh, animal than the Weberian bureaucracy, but it has been found in other parts of the world. There is a famous book uh, on public administration by Herbert Kaufman from the United States about uh, the Forest Service in 1960s, which uh, he explains the success that the problem was, you know, that this was before people had actually any of the communication tools that we now have. We're speaking about the 1950s and early 1960s. Now, how did the central administration in Washington manage to get their policies implemented in these gigantic countries out in the forests? Now, they did this by ideologically training their low-level bureaucrats into the mission of that organization. So it was not run in this barbarian sense by rules and regulations, but by a common understanding of how problems should be solved. Hmm. Sort of an indoctrination in a sense. Yeah, you can say. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen this in Sweden also. Uh, I wrote my dissertation about this many years ago, uh, the labor market administration. So it's a very special type of administration that is actually quite efficient in when you have to implement a policy in an area that is very volatile. Because if the area is very volatile, like the labor market or, or nature, the forests, <laughs> things happen that cannot be predicted, rules will not work because you cannot write so many rules. Instead, you have a system where the local bureaucrats are supposed to know the mission of the organization and act in the field as they think that the leadership would have acted had they had that type of information. And in organizational theory, this is a quite well-known, how should you say, organizational animal, but it's completely unknown by most economists and political scientists. <laughs> uh, and uh, my analysis is this is exactly what China has. And it's quite efficient. It has one drawback. It doesn't work well with democracy because in democracy, you're supposed to shift government and the loyal bureaucrats are supposed to implement another policy. Now, that cannot be done with this type of cadre ad administration because they are so ideologically connected to their mission. So it's like a super tanker. You, you, you cannot shift it easily. But China doesn't have this problem because they don't have democracy. Yeah, that's, that's, that's I'm interesting. I'm not saying this is, I mean, I'm just trying to explain this puzzle. And it's an I, hypothesis. I, yeah. I can see that, that my colleagues in China are citing this little article more and more <laughs> because they think I found something. Yeah, I, of course, tried, tried this with, with, my, with my China expert colleagues also in Europe, and they think that it's, it's, I have a point, yeah. Yeah. So your, your reasoning, to sum it up, is basically that they don't have autonomy, nor do they need it, because they are an autocracy, of course. And this, by the way, is interesting, because if your argument is true, it might mean that it's even less likely that China will become a democracy, because they have this kind of a barrier. But anyway, so I, I understand that part. It makes, it makes complete sense. Y just so. one thing. They do have local autonomy. So they, they do have autonomy how to solve the local problem. But they are supposed to solve it like the leadership would have sold it had they had this local information. If they don't do this, they are basically sacked or fired, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So it's not like they are machine bureaucrats yeah, of that course, have of to course. Mm -hmm. sort of in a machine-like way follow established sort of rules. No, yeah. no. So I understand that part and I think it's quite convincing. My doubt here is where does competence come from in this system? It comes from, if you actually look at it, they train their bureaucrats very much. The competition for getting into those schools where you become a, a party bureaucrat is enormous. You know, they have like 50,000 for every place. Hmm. So there so is sort of a, a privilege. huge, it's, yeah. The, so they, they can actually pick the good brains. They can do that. So I think it's not only party loyalty that works here. It's both party lo loyalty, of course. You can't do things that the party don't want. 
but it's also a high level of technical competence, for example. Contribua para a continuidade e crescimento deste projeto no site 45graospodcast.com. Seleciona a opção Apoiar para ver como contribuir, diretamente ou através do Patreon, bem como os benefícios associados a cada modalidade. When one thinks of a country so different as China, and even with your explanation, it's almost impossible not to think about the role of culture, right? And, and I'm thinking, you mentioned the organizational structure, and actually I had um, a previous guest who you might, whose name you might know is called von Strompenaars. He's, he's Dutch and he has, he's an organizational theorist and he has this book about cultural differences. And his book was actually written in the 80s. So the main focus was not yet on China, but on Japan. So, so the whole thing was about how companies in Japan were ruled in a different way. And what he tries to explain is that they are more collectivistic, which is a different model, but was still working well. And it's to some extent what we see also uh, in China. And, and I'm thinking, might that also help explain what's going on in the, in the government there? I don't know. I mean, I have found this organizational model both in the United States and Sweden, and it worked there. For quite but it was an exception there, right? Yeah, but uh, these were quite two very important public administrations. Secondly, around the world, you now see people who have left China who run businesses, small businesses, big businesses. They seem not to have a problem to adjust to the Western culture. So I don't know what to do with I'm an institutionalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to do with cultural explanation. I mean, people are not cultural dopes. I think cultural explanations, they are... They are simply too structural. No, that's true. It's, it's a bit like the, the country size <laughs> that we were yeah, talking about yeah, before. Yeah, you can't... But, but that doesn't mean that they are wrong. Right? <laughs> Not necessarily, but I don't think they are so convincing. For example, I'm arguing for that people around the world seem to have a quite common understanding of what should count as corruption and quality of government. In countries with a high level of corruption, people do not internalize corruption as okay. This is very clear from the Afrobarometer, for example. They've had data from many African countries that are highly corrupt. When you describe corruption to them in this survey, they say this is wrong and should be punished. So uh, I'm not so taken by, by cultural, ex cultural explanations here. Basically, cultural explanation, they say, what happens, happens because it happened before. That's not much of an explanation. It's basically just a repetition of the data. There is basically no distance between the dependent and the independent variable here. Well, th there is if you can conceptualize it. So there are a lot of, of aspects of culture, like collectivism versus individualism, moral universalism. So there, if you're able to, to conceptualize it, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but it's not very different from the quality of government as impartiality in a sense. So what you've done is be able to, to conceptualize it in a sense that you're able to differentiate it from, from the outcome. And without doing it, you would be measuring the outcome. But because you were able to, to define it as something different and here in, in China... In the f I mean, if you take a reasonably low corrupt country like Sweden, we have had some very big corruption scandals when Sweden's, Swedish companies go and do business in more corrupt countries. So I think people adjust very quickly yes, to, the, to the new thing here. Mm -hmm. And they do this because they feel that yeah, we don't pay the bribe, we will lose the contract because some other company will pay the bribe. Institutions rule culture instead of the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I think mm. so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back to a point I think you've made already twice, but it's important enough to highlight because there's a there's a debate there regarding whether corruption is universal or not, or is country specific or culture specific. And, and you, the way you interpret the data is that it means that people all around the world have a similar perception of a similar idea of what's corrupt or not, regardless of what happens in the day of, of the way they adjust to their day to day environment, right? Yeah, I cite my colleague Sten Wiedmann, who have studied very, very remote villages in India. And he finds that what they are longing for is the barbarian bureaucrat to come and fix the situation. <laughs> of uh, course, the they, Afro don't, they don't use that expression, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, of course not. But if you speak with anthropologists, they say, oh, no, you cannot have a universal definition. You know, it's very different. And I say, well, okay then you will have a definition of corruption per country or per city, 
or per region or per village. How many do you want? And um, it's not the case that you can then prescribe exact the same policy for every country or region or city. You have to know that specific case. And here I think we as social scientists should think like medical doctors. Now, I happen to have a lot of friends who are medical doctors, and I found out one interesting things quite a number of years ago. They don't really like if you ask them about the medical problem you have. They don't want to say anything. And first I thought this was strange because they are my friends. But then they explained to me, no, they said, it will be unethical for me to say something about your problem without first closely examining you and taking all the tests. Why? Because, you know, every patient is in some way unique. Take a simple case. We know that antibiotic works, but there are people who are seriously allergic and you have to know this. And this is how I think we should think about policies against corruption and low quality of government, we can produce some universal knowledge. But of course, you cannot implement this like a blueprint everywhere. You have to, we have to collaborate with people who have specific knowledge about that country or that region or city or village, like you do in medicine. So you have to closely examine the case before you cannot come from I'm a generalist, but I, I don't think I could come to any place with a prescription without first having collaborated with someone who really knows that specific case very well. The analogy with medicine is actually a pertinent one because they are medicine and the social sciences have a lot of things in common. You have many variables to take account of, and, and that's the reason why both work with probabilities and correlations and not with and they're not deterministic, right? And we work with experiments also. And with experiments, yeah. Of course, they are most more difficult to find in the social sciences. Well, we've done a, quite a number of exper experiments, yeah. yeah. We've established, I think, right in the onset of the conversation, that quality of government is key to development. But I guess that's not equally determined to all outcomes, right? So, so if you... Let's say we go to a country which is a democracy, but has low quality of government or has a lower quality of government than it has of quality of, of democracy. What outcomes would be severely compromised there and what outcomes could we expect to still find, despite the ineffective government, to, to find somewhat achieved? It's a difficult question to answer, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. You can obviously have, to some extent, quite impressive economic growth without high quality of government. Italy in the 1960s, for example, or from 1955 until 1973, a fantastic economic growth. Or Brazil, Still, I'm thinking in the, Brazil, in, the two, yeah. in the early yeah. 2000s. Yeah. And this can be driven by all kinds of things. In the Italian case, you had enormous amount of labor force that were willing to work for very little money from the South, for example, and many other cases. But then comes like a tipping point where it doesn't work anymore. And it's I just been reading a book by two economists about the Italian situation. Italy, you know, has had very, very low growth the last 25 years, one of the lowest in Europe. And they explain this by the lack of meritocracy, both in the public sector and in the private sector. And also what we would define Economists would use the word rent-seeking and we would use the word corporatism, that very strong lobby groups can force regulations that benefit them but are detrimental to society as a whole. So you can grow to a certain level, but then it stops because you lack the quality of government factors that are important for becoming Denmark, so yeah, to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can grow because that growth is not... Of course, I mean, in a market economy, not they're entirely dependent on, on government, but then at some point, the lack of steering will, or the lack of... Yeah, it will know. hit back. And then yeah, it's very, regulation, very, yeah. it's very difficult to get out of this system, yeah. of course. And what are the outcomes that are most severely compromised by low, low quality of government? L long term policies would be my intuition, but... Low, I think the major effect of low quality of government is that it destroys social trust. Or social capital. Yeah. Which I think I actually I came to this research from 
research in social capital and social trust. I was recruited by an American colleague, Robert Putnam, in the mid-1990s to a project about this. And I came to the same conclusion as he, that social capital, social trust is a kind of basic variable that explains most other things, uh, and that is, is a very important asset to have for a society. However, I came to a completely different understanding of how social capital is generated. His argument was that it was generated by people being active in voluntary associations. And we found no evidence at all for this. Nothing. So we, we came, and I say we because I work with Dick Linstolle and other colleagues, we came to a, a difficult situation. There was a new concept, social trust, social capital. We could show that it had an enormous importance for many valued outcomes, but the main theory how it was generated didn't work. And so we decided to sort of turn the tables and, and, and see maybe it doesn't come from below, maybe it came from above, and bang, we found it. <laughs> so it's very clear that when people make up their mind, if they think other people in general can be trusted, the perceptions of people who work in the public sector is very important. We have this from experiments, survey data, case studies, whatever. So basically what you're saying is that it's not social capital which leads to quality of government, it's quality of government which leads to social capital, which leads meaning that, which improves yeah, social capital. Yeah, that is very clear. There is a handbook uh, by uh, my colleague and co-author Ricky Slainer, where there is a very good chapter by a Korean scholar, Sung Ju, that actually he summarized the argument very nicely. No, it's very clear that the Chinese proverb is correct. The fish rots from the head down. <laughs> uh, and the theory runs, we have an article that has just been accepted by the American Journal of Political Science where we have run another experiment showing this. It's very clear that when people perceive that those who are responsible for the rules of the game are cheating or dishonest, and so they lose trust not only in them, but in people in general. And I think it works like this. So if you live in a society where you find or your knowledge or mindset is that teachers, principals, public health doctors, policemen, judges, university professors, they are dishonest, incompetent, corrupt. You will make three inferences. One is you will say, if you cannot trust people like them, why should you trust people in general in this society? They have basically almost taken an oath that they shouldn't just look out for their own interest, but for the public good. Secondly, you will realize that most people in such a society, in order to get what they need, health care, schools for their kids, protection, they will have to be engaged in all kinds of shady deals. And thus they cannot be trusted. And the third thing that will happen is that you yourself will realize that you know, in order for you to get what you need in life, you will also have to become a dishonest person. <laughs> and if you cannot be trusted as an honest person yourself, why should other people in your society be trusted? So I think this is the main bad effect of low quality of government, is destroy social trust. There are other bad effects, of course, but, but this is the main effect. So you think that the main effect of low quality of government is destroying social trust, and the main cause of social trust is quality of government. So the main yeah. determinant. Yeah. So you're, you're, I mean, you're, how can I put this? I believe the research, of course, and your argument is, is persuasive, but isn't that also putting too much weight on government? Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? So, so he's making it, it seems like the government is what leads to everything in a, in, or at least which it's the main cause of one of the most important dimensions of life in society, which is trust. You can be a very nice, trustworthy and honest person in a high corrupt society, but only towards your close friends and family. You will have particularized trust, not generalized trust. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, which is what happens exactly in low, low social. Yeah. So this, uh, I mean, this was discovered many, many years ago in the famous book by Edward Banfield when he studied this uh, small Italian village in the south. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the moral basis of bad development or something of that is the title. You know, government is not only the national state. 
effect. Yeah, I think you will have the same effect if, if you find bad government in your local village. I did uh, an article with uh, an anthropologist and we used the uh, Human Relation Archive at Yale that has thousands and thousands of anthropological studies. And to our surprise, we found instances of corrupt practices also in indigenous societies, in tribes. And we couldn't figure out, you know, how come? What, what is this? There is no state. <laughs> but our thinking was like this. Well, every society, no matter how, you're not supposed to use the word primitive, but let's do it so. Even in a very primitive tribal society, there has to be some people who take care of public goods, defense, some minimal type of justice, uh, irrigation, water, taking care of infants, whatever. Now, what people universally think is unacceptable, corrupt, is when those who are set to handle the public goods transform them into their private goods. And this can happen in a very small community, right? In a small club, I mean, it can happen. It's not necessarily that, you know, it's the national state. I think if you, even in low corrupt Sweden now, or reasonably low corrupt, there are now a lot of reports that in certain immigrant areas, powerful families as clans are basically wielding a lot of power. And I think, I mean, tell me if you agree you agree with this, but I think that could also apply to even companies and organizations, right? So even, even within, uh, as a company gets larger, when it's not like a family-owned company, so it's, it's recruiting from the outside, it can be run in a partial or an impartial way, right? So th that will also tend to influence the way... This is what these two economists have written this great book about Italy. I can send you the reference of saying why those family companies cannot, in so many cases, compete on the international level. They do not recruit the most competent ones. It's their nephews who are yes, in yes, yeah. positions. Yeah. And there is an excellent uh, number of papers by a Canadian economist, John Helliwell. Some of them are very much about what happens in companies. And he can show very much that if you think that your company is run in a fair and just manner, that has a very important effect on your feelings of, of trust and happiness. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, is there any research done cross-country comparing corruption in the private sector, in the public sector? Not that I really know about. Yeah. I think quality of government, you know, it doesn't include corruption within companies because we think this is ordinary criminality or bre breaches of trust. It, one of the parties in a corrupt dealing has to be in the government. Otherwise, we don't think of it as corruption. But you would think of it as lack of impartiality, wouldn't yes, you? Yes, yeah, yeah. But a private company doesn't have... If you own a company, you don't have to follow rules of impartiality. You can employ whoever you want. You can employ people you, who you think are beautiful or, or share your religion or come from the same village as you. You don't have to follow rules of impartiality. That is not how the market economy works. No, of course, you don't have to. But, but as you were saying before, an impartially, impartially in the sense of meritocratic run company, would tend to lead, lead to development in the same way that an impartially... I would guess that, that but I, you know, I'm not a business economist, yeah. <laughs> but I would guess that if you try to recruit people who are more competent, that would sort of increase the likelihood that the company would go yeah. well. Yeah. But uh, ma many comp companies don't do that. They want people like themselves. There is a famous, there is a famous <laughs> story of the... Ericsson company in Stockholm, who was 15 years ago big on mobile phones. Yes, yes, I remember you. Yeah, and so they sent their engineers to a, a fair in Frankfurt, and they found the first prototype of the uh, iPhone there. And they looked at it and to, uh, came back to Stockholm and said, no, this is useless. This phone will not work. This is hopeless. We should not go there. All of them came from the same technical school in Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs>
they might as well have sent just one well, person. They had recruited to... people like themselves. There were no one who was saying, well, maybe we should take a second look or so. And now they don't produce any phones anymore. How many <laughs> billion iPhones have mm-hmm. been sold? Is it 200 or something? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Such things happening in private companies, you know. You, you recruit people who are like you because you think they are easy, the easiest ones to work with and they will understand you. Impartiality is, is not a, a big thing, I think, in the private sector. Let's go back to the democracy, which is where we started our conversation on, uh, because that leads us into maybe some solutions. You mentioned already that there's no panacea, of course, but you mentioned right in the in the beginning that there are some aspects of democracy which might go counter to quality of government, especially in young democracies or underdeveloped. But there are, of course, those are the more intuitive aspects of democracy which promote quality of government. The most obvious one is accountability in the sense of you being able to to sack the government and put someone else or, or some other party in its place. But there are some other dimensions like checks and balances, free media, uh, other dimensions of democracy that, that promote quality of government. What do you think are the most in- important or, or, or put in a different way, if one wants to improve the quality of government in a country, starting on the input side, starting on the, dem- the democracy side, what should be the main priorities? Transparency and control over party finance. It's interesting you mentioned that because I always have the doubt of whether transparency is a dimension of democracy or of quality of government. You put it on the democracy side. Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't have transparency, you cannot know what the government have done if you cannot get the figures or the documents and so on. Sure. No, no, I understand that. So but I isn't... think, uh, I think yeah. uh, transparency is, is a central part of, of democracy. How could journalists report if they couldn't get access to, to information and documents? Uh, so I think transparency and, and also that you find some way to have uh, that the political parties cannot plunder the public coffers. That seems to be very important. Elections, hmm, you know, this book by Aachen and Bartels, Democracy mm. for Realists, yeah. doesn't give a very good picture of the possibility for, for voters to actually do what they are supposed to do. They are too short-sighted, the, the issues are too complicated, and, and they are too tribal. So would you say in that sense that horizontal accountability is more important? So uh, basically separation of powers, the media? So yeah. you... I mean, basically, I lost trust in this when Trump was elected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah. you, if you ask me personally, that such a person could be elected uh, to this uh, very important position made me lose trust in, in elections, yeah. That's true, but wouldn't you say that the way the events ran their course actually proved that democracy works as it should? Because the way I don't I don't remember who the game was. is not over. Yeah, and and I don't I don't know I should know who said this in the first place. I don't know actually, but uh, someone said quite rightly that the, the main benefit of democracy is not putting the right guys there; is being able to take the the, the wrong guys out. So, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, right? But he might come back. Yeah, he might come back, yeah. Or someone else like him. Yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> even worse. Yeah, that's true. But the research is strong on this link between transparency and the improved ability of democracy to, to lead to quality of government? I would say so, yeah. yeah. I don't have the numbers in my head, but mm-hmm. it also it, it makes it very important. I mean, take my case in Sweden. Anyone, anyone can come to my office and say, I would like to see Professor Rothstein's travel bills for the last five years. And our head of the department are not allowed to even ask for why. They're just supposed to present the papers. And of course, knowing this, people like I knowing this, you are very careful how you spend the public money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. I would, of course, be as careful even if this didn't exist. Mm. But I guess many of my colleagues wouldn't be. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that, but uh, this puts uh, knowing that this can happen, and it happens, of course, makes you think twice before doing things even in the gray. I mean, for me, who have been running the Quality of Government Institute, I had to explain to my young colleagues that if you're in such an operation, you cannot do things even in the gray. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's you have true. to be cleaner than Jesus or yeah. <laughs> whatever. 
<laughs> I mean, this is this is of course important. Yeah. I mean, it would be uh, a big thing if if journalists would find out that yeah, of say uh, yeah. you have a political science operation uh, that is promoting democracy that is run like uh, autocracy, for example. Mm-hmm. That, that wouldn't look nice. Or you have an anti-corruption research operation that. Are doing bad things with public money. That wouldn't be nice. Yes, an anti-corruption agency run entirely by a single family. Yeah. For instance, <laughs> I understand you. You're saying that looking at the, the case of Sweden, but from a reform standpoint, I'm a big defender of trans- increased transparency. Don't get me wrong, but just increased transparency alone might not be enough, right? Because you, no, no. if you lack enough free media and wide readership and a civil society willing to engage and social trust. And then we are back to the beginning. So no, no, I, I think I know what to say after this, but, but those are also preconditions to citizens being able to citizens and the media being able to, and the other parties being able to exert that accountability, right? Well, there are other things that are important in my latest book. I point at five things. So having national audit system, that is professional and that also publishes broadly their reports seems to be important. Meritocracy in itself improves the system. You can say it's too close to to quality of government, but from a policy perspective, it's not. You can, as you can uh, have uh, observers checking if the elections are going in the right way or done in the right way, you could have international observers uh, taking part in the recruitment of high-level civil servants, for example. So you would be sure that they were not only recruited because they belonged to the right party and so on. Broad-based universal free education seems to be very important. Mm. And I was surprised, but it's very clear that gender equality has a positive effect. Now, many are surprised by this, saying, why are women more honest or so than men? And what is it? I say, according to the Swedish healthcare law, if you are a doctor, you are allowed to prescribe a drug or a treatment based on two grounds. One is scientific knowledge, but the other is proven experience. So you don't know why people get well, but they do. And that <laughs> is how I think about gender equality here. But... Hey, look that's how medicine works for a long time. Yeah, yeah but I mean, hey, look at criminality. Open any prison in the world. And, that's an easy and, one, uh, yes. Uh, hmm. And take take a look at who is there for serious crime, and you will find out ninety six percent are men. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. corruption is also, uh, uh, for the most part, illegal. Why wouldn't we see the same there? Mm-hmm. That's an interesting this, point. Yeah. Why this is so, I don't know. I'm not mm. a neurobiologist. Or I'm an not evolutionary to psychologist. Know this, yes. <laughs> or an evolutionary <laughs> psychologist. But it's one way to think about gender equality here is in the following way that most countries have over the years seriously discriminated women in the public sector when it comes to recruitment and promotion. Now, if a country says, well, this is bad and we are now seriously, seriously going to do something about this. Discrimination of women is absolutely not okay anymore. That is a very important signal about impartiality. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. (laughs) Yeah. If you shouldn't discriminate based on gender, maybe you shouldn't discriminate against on other grounds when you recruit people to or promote people in the public sector. I mean, there are a hundred different definitions of gender equality. But for me, uh, impartiality is very important. It shouldn't play any role if you're a man or a woman when you apply for a research grant or a position or a promotion and so. So for me, it's it's very centered around impartiality in the exercise of public power. In country that takes a serious step here, and some countries have done this, sends out a very important signal uh, about impartiality. And I mean, if you take universal education, for example, when it was established in the late 19th century, it was then a revolution in many countries that also girls should get education, and even more so that they were to be educated together with the boys. That was a serious revolution for gender equality, maybe one of the most important ones. 
Italy here is very interesting when it comes to education. Italy in the 1860s, when the country is united and established, gets a very radical educational reform. Every child should have three years free education. The policy is implemented to the letter in the northern parts of the countries, hardly anything in the south. And we see the effects 150 years later. Hmm. But why, why, why was that? Why wasn't it implemented in the south? Because of clientelism, corruption, lack of ambitions. Yeah, the, the usual Because of prior, condi- prior institutional conditions. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And we see the effects 150 years later. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that idea of gender equality is interesting because it can work in two ways. It can work because it signals impartiality, as you were saying. It can also work when we are analyzing it because it's heavily correlated with other improvements in impartiality, which we are not measuring, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's that's a puzzle in and of itself. But, it's also it seems... important to establish reasonable professional tax administration and to tax the people. One finding we have from uh, ethnographic data (laughs) that surprised us was that we had research assistants in African, highly corrupt African countries interviewing mid-level people, not the poorest one, not the elite, but say heads of school principals, heads of local health services and so on. They came with that with a very interesting report, several of them. They said, well, They don't have a different idea of corruption than we do in Sweden. They think it's bad. They think it seriously hurts their countries. Then two of our research assistants were a little smart because they said, well, if people think like you that corruption is really bad and that it hurts the country, why isn't there more protest? And then came from many a very interesting answer of, from many of our informants. It's not my money. They don't pay any taxes. They don't pay any uh, wage tax. They don't pay any property tax. They pay some trade taxes, but you don't feel that so much. So what the political elite is doing by maybe plundering natural resources or stealing Mm. aid money, it's bad. Mm. But they don't Mm. care because it's not their money. (laughs) But in a country like like Denmark, where you pay extremely high taxes... You care, yeah. You care a lot about your money. (laughs) Yes. Of course, in the other case, it's also your money, but it's less obvious. Yeah, (laughs) it's less less obvious, yeah. (laughs) It's less obvious. It seems quite important. I don't argue for very high taxes on the Danish level, but still, it seems very important to get the functioning tax administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It makes people more more demanding. Yeah, if, if it's not your money, why should you care? Yeah, yeah. So then you get some political mobilization, hopefully, against corruption. <laughs> That's quite interesting. Boo, this was a um, very interesting conversation, as I was expecting. Very nice. I really uh, I'm mindful of your time, so I'll let you go. Yeah. Um, was there anything I didn't ask that you wanted to, to say about this topic? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's no, good. But this has been a, a very building the quality of government institute and that it's now running without me, basically. Mm. I'm, I'm just a senior consultant there is 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 has been a, a great great it's a hell of a project yes yeah and uh, now we have money for another four or five years so it's uh, it's been really good and to work with my and i should say i say we all the time but many of the research results i present are not mine they are from my my very able and talented colleagues in mm-hmm. this operation True. That's the way science works. So that's yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. all right. That's, yeah. you, you are about 30 people, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. In the quality yeah. of government. Is, yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's a, a, I think yeah. next to the World Bank, we are the largest on a global scale on this specific topic. Yeah. Wow. Actually. Yeah, I got a question from, I was at Stanford and I was... Francis Fukuyama invited me to give a talk for his grad students and I presented our research and one of Of course, he has a definition uh, different different from yours, of course. Yes, yeah, we yeah, didn't yeah, talk yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I admire him a lot. But yeah. um, She came up to me and said, uh, Professor Rothstein, I, I don't get this. A bunch of Swedes <laughs> studying corruption. What do you know about corruption? Yeah. It sounds like a bunch of nuns running a script club. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I thought the same when I, when I first came across it. <laughs> but I, my only defense is this, that maybe maybe if you are in the middle of the forest, you don't see the trees. Yeah, if, that's know, true. If you are yeah. a little outside the forest, 
you can see the trees maybe but i don't know but it was fun <laughs> <laughs> no, no and it's true thanks a lot for your availability thank you thank you it was great my pleasure este episódio foi editado por Hugo Oliveira. Contribua para a continuidade e crescimento deste projeto no site 45graospodcast.com. Seleciona a opção Apoiar para ver como contribuir, diretamente ou através do Patreon, bem como os benefícios associados a cada modalidade. 